Oh, it's, it's live. Oh, oh, okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen in viewer land. I'm Knox. And I'm Burgess. And welcome to the Gold Rush Tribune. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today we will be co- Knox, do you hear that? I do hear that, Mergers. Do you think it's- Breaking news? Hello, ladies. And gentlemen, I'm Jim, here with Ted, and we're bringing you Breaking News! Five minutes every five hours. So, Jim, why is it called Breaking News? Five minutes every five hours. Well, it's called Breaking News! Five minutes every five hours, because we give you breaking news for five minutes every five hours of the day. At times such as 5 a.m., 10 a.m., 3 p.m., and 8 p.m. So, what breaking news do we have today, Jim? Well, today we will be going over the hard facts of the gold rush, covering the nitty-gritty and the day-to-day -day lifestyle of the miners. Let's get started. As you all well know, recently gold was discovered in California, and people are swarming there to get even a small taste of the vast riches and expanses of buried treasure. People come from all over the country to find their fortune. While many of the miners strike it rich, most do not and are disappointed. The people who are making the real money here are the vendors and suppliers to the miners. One man in particular, Sam Brandon, has become the richest man in California in just a year. Before the gold rush, he bought pans in mass for 20 cents apiece, and when miners came from all over, he sold them for $15 each, making over $36,000 in just two months. While more people are coming from all over to mine, they are disrupting many of the local Native American tribes around the area. Also, with all the mining and panning for gold, the American River has actually swelled up to be higher than the surrounding valley, causing massive floods. I just hope that the ambition of the American people doesn't destroy everything that we've worked to protect. And that's our five minutes. I'll see you again in five hours. Back to you, Knox and Murgis. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mr. Elliot Hughes, here for you all with the book review portion of our show. Today, we're going to cover a book published in 1844 that's gained a lot of popularity recently. It regards a subject very dear to our hearts, Christmas. I speak, of course, of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. For those of you who haven't read it, the book follows the story of a miser named Ebenezer Scrooge. Now, this old grump dislikes pretty much everything, and he especially hates Christmas. However, he is visited by three ghosts who teach him the true meaning of Christmas, and by the end of the book, he has learned to appreciate it. Charles Dickens has also written several other recently popular books, including Gombe and Son, David Copperfield, and Oliver Twist. I would personally recommend reading this novel to children and adults of all ages. It is a truly inspiring classic. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're here today with a very special announcement. We've brought scientist Hippolyte Louis Fizeau here, live on our show. Knox is escorting him into the building as we speak. In the meantime, who exactly is Fizeau? Well, Mr. Fizeau is a French scientist who has made a very important discovery recently. Using methods that he's about to explain, he calculated some speed that is apparently very important in, in the science community. You don't like it's important! I have measured the speed of light! Light doesn't have a speed. We oui, it does! So, are you trying to tell me that if I strike this match... That it takes some time for the light from it to reach the rest of the room? We oui, it is a very small amount of time, but it is some time. And I have measured this time <laughs> with... <laughs> If this light thing moves so fast, how did you measure it? Arrête! Arrête, monsieur! What? Stop! Stop laughing! This is a very important discovery. Mon ami Foucault et moi, we set up two mirrors on opposite ends of Paris, very far away from each other. We got a large toast wheel and uh, adjusted the speed of the wheel. Once we, you know, shine the, the light on the one mirror, we adjusted the speed. Uh, once we knew that the light from one mirror would not reach the light from the other mirror, we could calculate how fast the wheel was moving, and that is the speed of light. <laughs> Wait. Wait a second. You measure the speed of light with mirrors and a wheel. Idiot! Imbécile! Ils sont fous, ces Américains! 
Hello everyone, I'm Sebastian, and welcome to the advice portion of today's show. Today, we are going to be addressing the problems of a Mr. Thomas O'Brien. Hello everyone! So, Mr. O'Brien, what is your problem exactly? Well, I'll put it nice and simple. My son, Jimmy, is thinking about leaving for the gold rush, and I just don't know what to do. My son is all I have left after my wife died, and everyone that I've talked to has told me that the gold rush is not an easy living. There are dangers along the way. I'll have to travel by sea. He could die from rotten food, spoiled water, or his ship could crash. This sounds serious. Please go on. Once he arrives in San Francisco, that's only the beginning. He'll have to have an entirely new life by himself, and that won't be easy. The salesmen there charge ridiculous prices for supplies that he'll need, and everything that he's getting easy here will cost three, maybe four times as much. While it may be true that he'll make more money, more, more money there than here, um, he'll most likely come back, you know, sick, heart-stricken, and broke. It sounds like what you really need to do is sit down and have a long, nice talk with your son. And ask him what he really wants to do. But what if I can't convince him that he shouldn't go? Maybe going really is the right choice for him. He has to experience his own life. Okay. Well, th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sebastian. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up our advice section. I hope you've all learned something from Mr. O'Brien's experience. Goodbye. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mr. Elliot Hughes, back with the book review portion of our show. For today's second review, we're going to be covering Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. This book was published recently in 1850. Despite, despite the massive amounts of controversy surrounding it, it's become wildly popular. Now, the book's controversy comes from its risque plotline, so I might recommend that mothers cover their young children's ears as I read my summary. Here goes. An American woman in the 1600s commits adultery and is impregnated. She is disgraced and punished when the government paints a red letter A on her skin. The book details her struggle with society. In addition to The Scarlet Letter, Hawthorne recently wrote The House of the Seven Gables and The Blithedale Romance. This book is thought-provoking and well-written, but the content matter is heavy. If you are looking for a challenging read, I would recommend this book hands down. However, if you are simply out to entertain yourself, this is not the novel for you. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dowell, and today we will discuss, on our popular cultural segment, the cultural ramifications of slavery, what styles are in, and what the lead health advisors are saying. As you all well know, the Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, has taken that nation by storm. Many people are still trying to realize what Beecher Stowe was implying and trying to grasp the cultural ramifications of this book. Also, the Kansas and Nebraska Act has recently been passed. This act will allow the states above the territory 36 degrees 30 minutes latitude to participate in slavery, thus declaring the Missouri Compromise null and void. Also, quite recently, the Harper News Monthly Magazine was written to review and preview the up and coming styles of the season. Thank you for watching our pop culture segment, everyone. Now you know what's in and what's out. But in all gravity knocks, have you heard about the most recent Empire Mineshaft Act? Oh, yes, Merges, and what a tragedy it was. Can you fill us in on the details? Actually, Knox, I can do you one better. We've got Mr. Dowell down on the scene, interviewing a survivor as we speak. Thank you, Merges. Hello, Mr. Anderson. Hello, Mr. Dowell. Pleasure to meet you. So, you're one of the three survivors of that horrible mine shaft accident that happened last Wednesday. Indeed I am, and what a horrible accident it was. Can you fill us in on, on the basics? Well, there were nine of us in the mine that day, and we were making good progress. My buddy, Petey, may he rest in peace, said that we were on the verge of a breakthrough, of finding a new vein. We redoubled our efforts, figuring we could strike it rich if we just pushed a little harder. Then good old Hammy Hess said something was up, said the mine was going to cave in. None of the rest of the crew believed him. They wanted to, you know, keep going, but they wanted to... It's okay. It's okay. They all survived! They did? No. I just needed to cheer you up so we could continue the story. Oh, well, Hammy and Chuck Mills and me got scared. We started walking away. The, other called us, the others called us fools for leaving, said they wouldn't give us our share. Then this terrible rumbling started, and uh, the three of us, we started running, and they followed, but they were too late. We were a couple of yards ahead of them, and we just got out when 
all these rocks just crushed him. And as we looked back, and it was it was horrible. I don't think I can ever come near mine again. It's okay. It's okay. You've been given a two million dollar settlement by the Empire Mining Company. Really? Of course not. I just needed to cheer you up so we could continue talking. Who died and who survived? Well, like I said, the uh, few of us, the three of us who started riding beforehand, me, Hamilton Hess, and Chuck Mills survived. Uh, those who didn't, well, we had uh, Duncan Muir, Kellen Brown, and Cody Phipps, Peter Cross, and oh, Ben Colbison. It was awful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this concludes our interview. I think we've painted out a pretty good picture of the events that took place that day. Dowell out. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sam Brandon, and I'm here to help you strike it rich. You may ask me, Sam Brennan, how are you going to help me strike it rich? The answer is simple. Mining equipment. You may be skeptical. You may be saying, well, I heard it was all about luck. Who gets, you know, gold and who gets the coal? And I say, no. If you have the right equipment, I guarantee you'll strike it rich. You'll be bathing in gold by the end of the year. Now, if you're still skeptical, here's a random consumer. Well, howdy! What do you think of Sam Brennan's mining equipment? Well, I came to California like any other folk. I wanted to strike it rich. And at first I was skeptical. But, you know, I bought Sam Brennan equipment because it was the best around available to me. And I was not disappointed. I found a small stream of gold dust and it turned out to be a large reservoir. And I made a fortune. Now, how rich are you? Are we talking kind of rich, McMansion rich, super rich, or super duper rich? Super duper rich. Excellent. Excellent. Now, uh, if you had to pick one article of Sam Brennan's mining equipment that you thought was your favorite, what would it be? The mining pan for sure. That's how I made my fortune. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam Brennan's mining equipment, mining pan, only $14.95. You can buy a high quality mining pan, you'll be rich in no time. Like this fella right here. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Marcus, do you hear that? Why, yes I do. I think it's time for Breaking News! Five minutes every five hours. That's right, folks. It's time for Breaking News! Five minutes every five hours. And it has been five hours, hasn't it? It sure has, Ted. Now, what are we going to be covering today on Breaking News? Five minutes every five hours. Well... To understand today's news, we have to take a little bit of a history lesson. In early 1848, the U.S. signed a treaty with Mexico, basically stating that Mexico had lost the Mexican War and would give a bunch of land to the U.S. This land included California. Now, for a while, everyone was content to let California be kind of off to the side, just a territory. But then, something miraculous happened. The gold rush... With the discovery of gold in California came a massive population increase. And now, when everyone looked at us, they realized that we needed to be something more. We needed to be... A state! That's right, everyone. On September 9th, 1850, California became the 31st state of the United States of America. And you, the gold miners, the shopkeepers, the residents, you were the ones that made it happen. Congratulations! Ladies and gentlemen, it's good to see you again. I'm Mr. Elliot Hughes, returning with the book review portion of our show. For today's third review, we're going to be discussing The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, published in 1844. Mr. Dumas certainly seems to have a great sense of suspense and adventure, because this book is full of it. This book pertains to the story of one Edmund Dantes, whose life is not going very well at the beginning. It is his wedding day, and he is arrested and taken away for a crime he did not commit. After several years in prison, he escapes with two goals, find his enemies and find the treasure of Monte Cristo. An avid writer of adventure, Dumas has also written books such as The Three Musketeers and The Man, and the Man in the Iron Mask. The Count of Monte Cristo is a thriller all the way. If you are a fan of action, this is the book for you. However, I recognize that not everyone is. If high adventure is not your thing, you might want to consider something else. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mr. Brewster, and welcome to the cooking portion of the show. 
Today we will be cooking with renowned chef Johannes Unger. And here he is! Thank you, thank you. Let's go to the chase. Today we will be making this very simple clam chowder. Great for your man to eat after he has had a long and strenuous day of mining and panning for gold. For this dish you will need the following items. One bottle of clam juice. One small serving of minced clams. One small onion. Two medium sized potatoes. Four ounces of heavy cream. And finally, bacon. First, you must cut the bacon into half inch slices, half inch, no bigger, no smaller, then dice your onions. Afterwards, you should peel and dice your potatoes. Next, measure out the cream you need. In a medium sized pot, you should cook your bacon until it's crispy and the fat rend it out. Then remove the bacon. Next, you should sweat your onion by putting it in the pot and stirring in the bacon fat. You will want, to be, you will want them to be soft and slippery. After the onion is soft, add the potatoes and stir them into the baking fat. Next, add your clam juice. After this, just let the chowder cook for a while, about half an hour. After this, you should add the cream and the minced clams. And that's that, your own home-style clam chowder. Enjoy! Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nick DiCarlo, and I'm a young, up-and-coming businessman in California. California gold rush, I'm getting a lot of heat recently. You know, people say it's unsafe, you can die, you'll go broke, and other bad things like that. But you haven't heard the real story. It may be true that while miners suffer terrible conditions, minuscule paychecks, and yellow fever by the boatload, owning a mining company is where it's at. I only got to where I am because I talked my way up to the top. I was able to convince people that I was best qualified to run their company. I once talked the CEO out of his own position. I've never even held a mining pan, and I'm making it rich off the backs of these hard-working foreigners. Yes, their lives are awful, but what do I care? I'm filthy rich. I think the gold rush has brought only prosperity and happiness to the beautiful landscapes of California. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone, to the book review portion of our show. I'm Mr. Elliot Hughes, and I'm sad to say that this will be our final review for today. Our last book will be Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, published in 1847. Jane Eyre is, through and through, a romance novel. The thing that sets it apart from the pack, however, is that the main character is a strong-willed, independent woman. She has encountered many challenges along the way to womanhood, and she handles them all with grace and strength. Although she is profound, Miss Bronte has not been very prolific. Her other works include Napoleon and the Spectre and Shirley, full colon, a tale. Romance novels are notorious for having specific demographic of readers. This book, however, is different. I would recommend it to most adults, especially those who enjoy romantic literature. I'm sad to say it, everyone, but I must go. Tune in next time for another set of book reviews and analyses. Farewell. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mr. Knox, and I'm here with you with a very special guest today, Levi Strauss! <laughs> so, Mr. Strauss, I hear you've become very successful in light of the recent gold rush. Indeed I have, Mr. Knox, but not because of gold. Please, tell us more. Gladly. When I first came to America, I had come from Bavaria to help my brother in his dry goods business. This was in 1847, I believe. When people first discovered gold in California, I moved to San Francisco. When demands for durable pants were heavy, I hired a tailor to make pants out of a tent fabric. Later, I substituted denim for tent canvas, and my industry was born. How did you expand this industry and cause it to become so popular universally and, and widely known? Well, as the demand for heavy-duty pants skyrocketed, I seized the opportunity and opened more and more stores that were selling these so-called jeans. Well, thank you for your time, Levi, and I hope you continue to be successful as ever. Thank you very much, Mr. Knox. We're out. All right, everyone, looks like our time's just about up. Well, we learned a lot and had a lot of fun during the course of this episode. And I hope you did too. Now, on behalf of the entire department at the Gold Rush Tribune, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. This has been the Gold Rush Tribune! Tribune.